Good afternoon, one and all. What day are we? We're Monday, 9th of May. It's about four o'clock in the afternoon. In fact, it's exactly four o'clock in the afternoon. It's great to see you. Thank you for joining us. We really do appreciate it. Marta is just wandering back in from Hello. asking our lovely clean Olivia to please stop hoovering because she, we tried to tell her at four o'clock, but she didn't get it. Uh, Marta, thank you for being here. How are you? You're welcome. I'm all right. Thank you. Looking Good. forward to this session. Yep. It's a big one, folks. We've got exercise physiology. There's a monster amount of information on this. We're estimating that we'll be in the region of one hour 15 today. We reckon the talk content about an hour uh the q a could be up to about 15 minutes so we should be have you out of here by about quarter past five okay folks if you're taking this live um a couple of things just as reminders you really should have your notes pages your practice questions which we hope you've had a go at you should have your model answers should have your mask schemes available to you that's how this this session goes particularly well even if you're watching this on demand then that still applies same things if you're not sure what any of those are look in the description or below you can go to the hub page and it, it does it all for you okay so you go and have a look at that it's all in the same place um also, we'd be massively grateful if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the like button on the video. That really does help us, okay? We went past 7,500 subscribers on the weekend. We were super happy with that. We're now gunning for 8,000, so we're on our way uh, to get there. Can I remind you as well that the content that we are covering in these sessions is the AEI-listed content for uh, for the A-level. So if... Um, so if you consider that that is uh, specifically that material that the exam board, in this case OCR, have confirmed will be on the paper for higher tariff questions, we don't know exactly what that means, but these topics are relevant and will pick up marks for you. And can I also remind you that the language that we have rendered into this session is the specific and the exact language of correct responses in here. And you'll notice, for example, we do the ergogenic age today. In some ways, it's kind of presented a little bit tedious. Lots of images kind of similar, but the language is precise and accurate. And folks, I cannot stress enough, if you get that language and those evaluative points into your answers, they're going to score you marks. So please learn them because <laughs> we can't do that bit for you. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I've missed anything, Marta. We um, want to remind questions. teachers free trials are available on the website. If you're not currently using us, 28 days, get your A-level kids onto the Marta's phone's going off. It's live. I've got a bruised arm. What are you going to do? Um, and final thing, reminder questions on the hub page there's a live chat there comes through to Marta she'll bring those questions to, to us we love it when you ask questions folks so please ask us a question we want to answer your queries okay I think we're ready to go Marta was it an important call no, or you know, know just was it I yeah just put it down. cool okay we're Sorry. starting with ergogenic aids this will be a, a, a chunk of a session uh let's get started this is the tough bit Okay, let's get into this. I didn't mean to do it that loud. Uh, let's get into this. Can I please urge you with all of our ergogenic aids, please notice the subcategory of aid we are talking about. In this case, for example, anabolic steroid is a pharmacological aid. Why? Because if you're asked an analyzed question, it's quite likely you'll be asked about multiple ergogenic aids and asked to give their strengths and weaknesses. If you're asked to evaluate, it's more likely that you're going to be asked specific strengths and weaknesses for specific uh, aids themselves. But also remember that what we're going to cover here is we're going to also going to cover the justify skill. And when you justify something, it's probably that you're going to justify, I mean, let's take uh, justify the use of creatine supplements for a Premier League football player or something like that. You're In that case, you're taking the characteristics of the ergogenic aid and you're saying why it's relevant or not relevant in a particular context. So all of those skills are covered, but also I've made sure that we've got our describing in, included here, you can see actually that here. Also, explain why, explain why um, so and so would use an anabolic steroid. This is very similar to the justifying skill. So I've tried to cover all of these skills with the images that we prepared here. So we're going to focus on the evaluative, but it helps us with all of these. So anabolic steroid, the granddaddy of drugs, I suppose. Uh, it's a synthetic hormone. It's based on testosterone, which of course is the male hormone. What does it cause on the positive side? It increases protein synthesis. So all that ribosome stuff you learned in GCC biology and beyond, those of you that went to A-level, that becomes relevant here because we're we're better capable of synthesizing proteins and of course the ones that we're interested in is those contractile proteins of the muscle okay particularly the actin and the myosin all for a different day therefore it causes muscle growth for us that is going to mean we have more muscle mass just note that this is going to increase strength power elasticity all of these things are going to go up our recovery gets faster, which is really helpful for people who are injured. Um, and therefore, we overall, we get an increased intensity and duration of activity. Now, if we reflect that steroids are a training drug, they increase the, the, the sort of the impact of training because we get a better intensity, we get it for longer. This means effectively we get more adaptations. 
And more adaptation just means more fitness. More fitness means better performance. But there are, of course, negatives. I mean, first of all, folks, recognize that this is an illegal street drug. So that alone is negative, right? But what does it cause? It causes mood swings, roid rage, this kind of increased anger and aggression. Uh, aggression is there. We can experience sort of like um, physical changes. Acne is a classic example. Long-term use can lead to liver damage. Can I please stress that this is because athletes, when they're doping, with steroids they will take a massive dosage okay so it's not like a normal sort of use of a steroid because you've got some health condition no these are massive doses of steroids and it can lead to hormonal imbalance which can lead to certain androgynous effects hormonal imbalance for example for men it can mean that they start they stop naturally producing testosterone for women it can lead to more sort of what you might in inverted commas called air quotes manly characteristics uh, a stronger chin more facial hair um, more prominent jawbone these things can develop because we're heavily, heavily used steroids. Now, obviously, we're talking about heavy usage. A second ergogenic aid, which is pharmacological, is EPO, erythropoietin. What a spelling. Okay, now, just a little distinction here. EPO is erythropoietin. H EPO is recombinant EPO. And what this means is it's synthetic. So we tend to find that it's this latter type. It's, it's sort of man-made. It's, it's synthetic. It's not naturally occurring. But of course, EPO itself is naturally occurring. Okay, so it's natural. And what we mean by that is we actually produce it ourselves. It actually stimulates erythropoiesis, which is the production of red blood cells in the bone marrow. Now, if we take it, road cyclist, this kind of athlete, we're going to get an increased stimulation of uh, red blood cell production. That increases hematocrit. Now, typically, our red blood cell would be 45%-ish of our overall blood composition. Now, this, of course, will increase because we're taking a uh, EPO. That gives us a greater oxygen carrying uh, capacity. It delays our blood to a higher intensity of exercise, and it gives us a greater VO2 max. Hence, our marathoners, hence, our road cyclists, hence, our triathletes, and hence, our open water swimmers. That's why they will use justifying EPO. It is illegal, and of course, it's been very, very widely used in sports, especially in the 2000s. It leads to hyperviscosity of blood. It basically makes the blood more solid, more uh, thicker. It means that we need a greater quantity of blood plasma to transport that blood. It can lead to decreased stroke volume because blood viscosity is so much higher and it can lead to blood clots as well. Now, the one thing to note about EPO is it was undetectable for a long period of time because there wasn't a test for it. So it became very, very popular. Think about your Armstrongs, think about your Tour de France, this kind of, this kind of thing. Next pharmacological aid is uh, another uh, naturally occurring hormone, this time HGH, human growth hormone. Okay, we tend to find that as we age, we get we produce less and less of this naturally. What does it do? Very much like our steroid, increased protein synthesis. It leads to muscle growth, increased muscle mass. We metabolize fat through beta oxidation more efficiently. It leads to increased blood glucose levels and we recover faster. So that for any kind of power athlete, think javelin thrower, um, think rugby forward, these sorts of athletes are going to really benefit from it from um, this particular hormone but of course it has negatives let me just remind you again it is illegal but it can lead to abnormal bone growth so this is a problem right? if you take large quantities of this stuff this is a, a hormone which occurs in its naturally at certain levels for a reason if we take higher levels that's going to lead to ab abnormal growth including enlarged organs and it can lead to diabetes why because that blood glucose level remains high for too long our uh, pancreas has to be overstimulated to release pancreatic fluids into the small intestine just remind you of your GCC apology um, and so on and so on so it can lead to effectively type 2 diabetes so there's a pharmacological aid in the form of HGH. Let's keep going. We're now into physiological aid. So we're now into a method. It's blood doping. So how do we do this? We do this via transfusion. We remove blood one to four weeks bef before participation in whatever we want to improve. We separate the red blood cells from the plasma. We store them in deep freeze. It's actually quite hard to do. It's actually hard to freeze red blood cells. And we retransfuse those red blood cells mixed in saline solution back into our system. What does it do? We get increased red blood cells, therefore we might go from naturally occurring 45% red blood cell, let's say, to 55%. There have been cases where it's been uh, thought to be up as high as 65%, which is absolutely outrageous. Uh, we get an increased level of haemoglobin. Of course, we have millions of haemoglobin per red blood cell. That increases oxygen carrying capacity, and that means that we can delay fatigue. I mean, specifically, we can delay OBLA to, I'm going to put up arrow, higher intensity. 
Now that's a really valuable thing to be able to do. So we don't start rapidly accumulating lactic acid until a much higher level of intensity of exercise. That's very, very positive. But the negatives, of course, are blood viscosity. By the way, it's illegal. <laughs> It's illegal. Uh, it's got potential for clots. It can lead to infections. Now, this is really comes from, uh, by the way, in no way am I encouraging you to do this, but this is really from sharing needles, which, you know, in, in like elite level really shouldn't be the case, even if it's cheating. Uh, and you get a decreased cardiac output because of that increased blood viscosity, as we said before. So, you know, th this, this is only really... Um, testable because of course how much red blood cell can vary from person to person but this is why we have what's called a blood passport not we elite athletes so that changes in, in you know radical changes in blood composition can be monitored over time and this sort of thing can be sort of assessed another physiological aid is iht intermittent hypoxic training what do we do we wear a face mask we have a gas tank attached to that face mask and of course that gas tank is putting out hypoxic air in other words we have got something significantly less than 21 percent o2 and if you think about atmospheric air what you're breathing in now it's about 20 20 to 21 percent oxygen right well what we're going to breathe in to this gas tank would be around about 15 percent okay so we breathe less oxygen it helps us to acclimatize to altitude red blood cells go up because we adapt that means more hemoglobin that means we transport oxygen better we get all of those uh, aerobic adaptations like increased mitochondria delay our blood to high intensity and we can buffer better remember buffering is the removal of lactic acid during performance in the presence of the um in the presence of the bicarbonate iron now there are negatives to wearing this mask on a treadmill for argument's sake it's temporary it doesn't last it's boring it's not natural right it's, it's a bit weird to be running with a face mask on it can decrease the immune function so in other words we might get poorly from doing this because it's not natural and um we might experience dehydration now this one's a little technical point there's my um sorry about that the, the dehydration you know think if, if you've got a face mask on and you're training on a treadmill you're not drinking water or whatever it is that you drink so that can lead to dehydration on a practical level now our physiological cooling aids i've sort of decided to present to you this way because i really want you to think about what we'd use for pre-event what we'd use for injury and what we'd use for post-event so first of all pre-event ice vests and cold towel wraps think about a marathon run on a really hot day what do they do they decrease cv drift this is when um despite no changing intensity our heart rate graph goes from it should look like this but it starts to drift upwards and then we have to recover so this here is a cv drift we've not increased intensity of our work but our heart rate is drifting up why because we've got increased blood viscosity we've got less blood plasma therefore it gets sticky we need a, we need greater force to push that around um therefore we've got less chance of overheating we're less likely to dehydrate and thermal strain on the athlete goes down which means they can perform at higher levels if we are injured what we're we going to use ice packs cooling, cooling spray cooling spray and the price method of course which of course involves our eye in the middle our ice why because we get less swelling in essence we get a decreased inflammatory response rest <laughs> less swelling why won't that come out and post event what we're likely to do after we've participated ice baths and cryotherapy i mean cryotherapy is damn expensive so it's not overly likely but ice baths aren't so much but we get decreased exercise induced muscle damage okay this means that we prevent or reduce doms we get fewer injuries but there are negatives now all of them you could argue we've got negatives but these ones at the bottom could lead, it's uncomfortable, right? I suppose it could mean that we don't deal with injuries that might actually be there and we can't be shoving elderly people in whatever it is, minus 170 degrees Celsius. That ain't humane, right? Some, their hips will come off. Um, <laughs> I don't know why I said that. Um, sorry, I just feel like I've been very, very rude to uh, elderly people. I'm so sorry. Now, amount of food, guys. I just want you to note these down as we go through this. Um, so first of all, if we are averagely active, okay, so if we've got an average level of activity, so someone who, you know, maybe is an adult doing an office job, maybe walking or cycling to work, but not doing much else, what we're going to find for these people is they want five to seven kilogram of carbs per day per kilogram. Okay, so you actually can measure this stuff, right? So someone who's averagely active, we want five to seven kilograms of carbs per kilogram to get that amount of energy requirement into that person. But if we're talking about an athlete, an active person, let's talk about an athlete for argument's sake, this person's gonna need 10 to 12 grams of carbs per kilo. So that's what we mean 
by the amount of food. Now I'm not going to get into food proportions when it comes down to um, when it comes down to things like um, let's say when it comes down to things like um, yeah proportions of different things. But let let me just well I'm saying I'm not going to but just make sure we put in here we are arguing that we would have 60 I said I wasn't going to do this we're going to have 60% carbs now can I say this diet is very generic we're going to be expecting between 15 to 20% protein we're going to be expecting something along the lines something along the lines of 20 to 30% fats now obviously or lipids now obviously you could count those up and you don't get 100 you could have 60 30 20 oh, that's 110 but you see my point it depends now can i just stress that these are very generic and these figures can be adapted in fact someone who is training a lot needs this figure to be up higher and this figure to be up higher okay we might find that someone who is like an endurance athlete they need fats but they don't need that many they need to be reducing their overall body weight so that their power to weight ratio is better so that composition is kind of important just to be aware of now where i want to spend a little oh, i should stress as well don't neglect vits don't neglect minerals We'll come back to fluids in a second, but these are important. Now, the timing of meals, I want to spend a little bit more deep, a little bit more time on. So, first of all, I want to be talking about pre-exercise. Okay. Now, generally speaking, we want to be eating three hours before. So, if you've got your rugby match, a three o'clock kickoff on a Saturday afternoon, your lunch should be around about midday. We also want it to be low GI. And what we mean by that is that slower release energy. In fact, let me put that in, slower release. So we want the energy to be slower release. We're thinking about a little bit of brown rice, a little bit of whatever it happens to be. Not huge amounts, but small amounts. Um, this, The impact of this is it increases glycogen stores. Now, let's be clear, this is not glycogen loading, which we'll come to in a second. Now, next little section I want to talk about here, again, is, is still pre, but we're now talking about two hours before okay so this is like another phase now two hours before you might be taking on things such as an energy bar now this energy bar is going to be faster acting energy and what does this do it tops up glycogen okay so it's quick acting and you just get that sort of peak of glycogen and it prevents hypoglycemia so it hypo let me just put this in here glycemia okay so it prevents hypoglycemia which is low blood sugar so we do it that way now i also want to talk about during performance okay so this is during all right what we're going to do here so we want some if we're doing a long activity let's talk about road cycling we want 60 to 90 grams of carbs per hour now this is probably going to come in the form of energy gels, a bit of fruit, it could come in the form of a chocolate bar, but we want something like that. The other thing about during is we want to rehydrate regularly, and we're going to come to hydration in a second, of course. So we want to rehydrate regularly. And finally, to finish this off, we're going to talk about post-exercise. Okay, so post-exercise, when after we've finished, obviously. So we want that eating to be 30 mins after okay this is what we consider to be sort of the glycogen window the refueling window and we're looking at one to one and a half grams one to 1 1.5 grams of carbs per kilogram per hour so folks that's quite a chunk that's quite a bit of eating right so we've got to be thinking about replacing that quantity and finally we want to repeat, depending on obviously how much we do, every two hours. Okay, so every two hours. So we want to eat immediately, 30 minutes after exercise, and we want to eat again uh, after two hours. Okay, now I just want to touch on uh, hydration a little bit here. So just let me jump to here. Hydration, a couple of points I want you to be aware of. We want you to be taking on board one litre of water per kilogram loss. Now, I'm not going to talk specifically here about the relationship between litres and kilograms, but those of you that are into your units will know that that's a very direct relationship. Now, there are positives to this. Why, why do we want uh, this hydration to take place? First of all, obvious one, we want to prevent dehydration. So that's an obvious, obvious point for us, and nice and simple. So we don't want to dehydrate, so therefore we hydrate, obvious. 
We also want to prevent loss of electrolytes. Now, the, we're really talking about minerals here, loss of electrolytes. So when we sweat, we can lose a little bit of... Um, we can lose a little bit of sort of uh, mineral that we've ingested and that can lead to sort of problems with muscular contraction. So we, when we drink, we're also going to take on potentially those electrolytes or electrolyte drink. We also get heat regulation. So because we drink, we're not likely to overheat, for example. We're also going to argue here that hydration is really important because it helps with blood. So if we say maintain blood viscosity, so our blood does not get thicker, this of course prevents um, CV drift, which we've mentioned already. So maintain blood viscosity. Let me actually link off that prevent, prevent CV drift, okay, which is that rising of heart rate despite no change in intensity. We're also saying we're going to down arrow prevent fatigue through rehydration. We're also arguing here that it's really good for concentration. I'm just going to put conch there. It's really good for concentration. And finally, last point here, I'll see if I can squeeze it in here. Hydration helps to prevent cramp. Okay, so a lot of information. And now we should be realizing already the scale of this ergogenic AIDS topic. Another nutritional aid is glycogen loading. Now I've already put the process in here for you. It's seven days. We do something different on day one to two and three to four to the last few days. We only start the carb rich diet in the last two days. Well, it's three days actually, but you're not going to have a very high carb diet on the last day. But notice we deplete glycogen stores, we increase fat and protein consumption, we deplete glycogen again. And where it says deplete here, this means training, this means exercising, and then we load. And we often combine this with the tapering of training. So we're actually decreasing the intensity. Why is it useful? We can get up to 50% better store, it takes longer to reach exhaustion, we get increased endurance. Why is it negative? When we're depleting here, here, we can experience hyperglycemia, low blood sugar, we can feel tired, we can feel irritable, I get that hangriness and all that we get water retention and bloating and that can lead to feelings of sickness and, and stomach discomfort creatine absolutely legal and very popular with elite games players we we can naturally get it from meat and fish it's a form of amino acid and we tend to take it in the form of monohydrate now what does it do more pc stores we can get a longer high intensity activity so it's not just a 10 second duration now maybe we get to 12 or 14 we get more max explosive strength. Why is it negative? It can make us heavier. It can lead to bloating. Let's go to our caffeine as our stimulant, of course. Other stimulants could be amphetamines. Of course, caffeine is completely legal again, whereas amphetamines wouldn't be. What does it do? It makes us more alert, increased activity of CNS. We get reaction time going down, which of course is a positive. We're faster. We get higher aerobic capacity. This is because we get better fat metabolism in the presence of caffeine. And we preserve glycogen because we're utilizing fats at a higher intensity. So that's really positive for endurance athletes, for games players, for, for um, combat athletes, because we've got the, like this alertness side and we've got this fat met metabolism side, but there's negatives. It's a diuretic. In other words, it makes you pee. It can lead to dehydration. Um, it can lead to insomnia. It's a stimulant. It keeps you awake. And finally, it's acidic. I don't know if you've ever had really good coffee, for example. It kind of gives you a bit of a burn in the tummy if you have take too much of it now by carbonate i could teach you i could do a whole hour on this by the way because i really enjoy this topic but we're talking about the hco3 okay so the bicarbonate ion it binds with hydrogen which of course has been released in the breakdown of lactic acid okay so it binds with that hydrogen ion and it converts that sort of fatiguing part of lactic acid into co2 and water which can then be breathed out now there's a couple of stages in between it forms carbonic acid carbonic acid then we're not going to get into that here but what overall it's called is called a buffering of lactic acid and therefore it's really helpful because it delays obla if we can be during exercise be removing obla we can work at higher intensities before we hit sorry if we're if we're processing lactic acid we can work at higher intensities before we hit obla that means increased intensity before obla but on the negative side it's horrible to eat this stuff and it gives you a tummy ache now i'm going to do one more before we change canvas i think i've almost cut this one off the bottom in fact i have hopefully you will see this image better i'm actually cut the bottom of it off on my canvas but what have we got here we've got our nitrate okay so what is it we've got nitric oxide increases exercise intensity Oh, by the way, first of all, this will—if you link back to your GCC 
biology studies in terms of the types of nutrients that plants are taking on through their roots. You probably could link that quite close to this because they're based in root vegetables and they're stored as nitrites in the body. So what do they do? Nitric oxide increases exercise intensity. It lowers blood pressure. It decreases resistance to blood flow. In other words, we can vascular shunt better. However, it can lead to headaches and dizziness. And I actually don't know what my third negative is. I'm sure you've got it in the screen in front of you. I can't remember right now. Um, but our nitrate works that way. Now, I need to change the canvas. That's a huge amount of information in one go. I'm a bit worried about time. Let's, uh, let's change to canvas two. Okay, let's do a couple of uh, answers on this. The first one's very simple. Identify the type of athlete that might be tempted to blood dope. Okay, so blood doping, we're obviously looking for an endurance athlete here, and I've gone for a road cyclist, see here, marathon runner, triathlete, any of these would be fine. We'd have actually said endurance athlete would have been a, a, you know, a perfectly reasonable answer to that, but we've, we've identified there someone, and it was very common in road cycling, especially in the 2000s. Um, explain how blood doping is carried out. So this is, this is you know, I'm going through a process here. So it's important we don't just learn the evaluation, but the process. Blood is removed about one month before. Red blood cells are extracted and frozen. They're thawed, mixed with saline and transfused. Okay, so I've gone through that process. I'm looking for three marks. I've made four descriptors. And hopefully, well, as we can see here, that gets me the mark in this sense. Okay, so I'm giving that process of how it's been done not just this the evaluation now this is where we get more evaluative i'm simply identifying here an advantage and a disadvantage now of course i could have just been asked to evaluate it and here blood doping it increases hematocrit level of red blood cell within the breakdown of blood and it's got a disadvantage the athlete can be banned for two years okay so it can lead to bans that's a lovely um disadvantage for all kinds of different drugs and an a drug because if they're illegal it can be bans i mean you can look in the mask skin. there's all kinds of um suspension we've got in here we've got in here uh it, it can lead to viscosity we've got in here infections but obviously our bands are a potentially good answer as well now we're here endurance athletes might use iht as an ergogenic okay, describe it first of all because they've named just iht I get a mark for saying intermittent hypoxic training. It's wearing a mask. It's a lower partial pressure of oxygen. So we've got there that's you know lower than atmosphere, atmospheric air. And of course, then we can go further. But I'm describing the process. You know, I could have maybe said we're doing it on a treadmill, that kind of stuff. Um, now let's go for a, a disadvantage and advantage of, of IHT. It causes growth of more red blood cells, which is good. This increases oxygen carrying capacity. But uh, you know, and I must though, go for a negative as well to get my mark. I must get one advantage, one disadvantage. So for this point here and for this point here, at the moment, I'm only on one out of two, even though they're both correct, because I have to get an advantage and disadvantage. However, wearing a mask can seriously limit the types of training that you can do, okay? So we can only do sort of treadmill work. Now I could have I could have been saying things like, you know, lead to dehydration because you can't drink or whatever happens to be, but we must make our other half of this to get the two marks. Now I'm gonna pause there um because we're going to move on to strength training immediately in fact we're not we're gonna have a little break as marta just told me that we're in the time for having a little break so we'll have a little break marta any questions yes there is one question a student is saying why do athletes undergo blood doping even if it gives you decreased cardiac cardiac output does this not counteract any performance benefit it gives you? Okay, I, I probably wasn't clear enough on that point. So the, the key word here is if, okay? So if we get that, uh, it seriously increased blood viscosity, that can then, if that happens, decrease cardiac output. It would be the same sort of theory rates and things like cardiovascular drift. You get an increase, you get a decreased stroke volume because the, the heart is effectively um, having to push blood with much higher resistance because it's thicker, more, more solid uh, around the system and it's that, the knock-on impact that would lead to decreased cardiac output. Of course, I suppose if you do blood doping well, then that particular negative doesn't occur because you get the balance right, you get the levels right, you get just the right amount of additional red blood cells back into the system, not to increase blood viscosity to a point where a decreased cardiac output would, oh, sorry, decreased cardiac output would occur. But of course it can occur, hence it's in the negative column. And um, what you would say in general, I mean, of course, you're right about the counteracting point though, because of course what we're looking for here is an increased blood carrying capacity, a de decreased cardiac output, and therefore uh, less blood being ultimately uh, redistributed to the working muscle would, uh, as you say, counteract that. But it's that if point. If we get a big increase in blood viscosity, we could then get a decrease in cardiac output as a result. And that would of course mean that you'd have to, uh, yeah, 
that, that would be the potential negative on that one. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. That's all for now. Oh, any questions from you, Martin? Anything as a non-PE person, Spanish and French teacher over here, anything you're just intrigued by IMP and just want me to answer for you? No, not really. No. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think everything is very clear. Is there anything that you think from what you've explained in this first section that you think tends to confuse students especially something that um yeah something that you would like to reiterate yeah i think the key thing for me is recognize those groupings the pharmacological the physiological the nutritional make sure that you can identify those groupings so that if you were to get a question for example about um analyze uh, analyze uh, um using your knowledge of ergogenic aid analyze um, pharmacological methods of improve of enhancing performance then you of course you can talk about those specific pharmacological and be able to differentiate them from physiological the other point is to reiterate the requirement to give strengths and weaknesses on these areas that really really is something now that typically would be posed in an evaluate question evaluate blood doping evaluate you know whatever it happens to be but of course it might be give you know state two advantages and two disadvantages it could even be a compare type question compare the impact of IHT and blood doping or, or, or compare the processes so you could even look at that kind of um, point the other skill as I mentioned earlier is that justify skill justify the use of caffeine for a marathon runner okay is it relevant or not therefore their strengths and weakness become then specific to a particular type of performer what about justify the use of anabolic steroids for an endurance runner okay that would be like far less relevant right but we know that Lance Armstrong took it as a cyclist. We know that other endurance athletes have taken it. So where is the relevance? Is it recovery from injury? Is it overall increase in muscle strength? So why would an endurance athlete? And there might be reasons why they wouldn't. Okay, so that kind of question again is a, is a possibility for you. Two more two questions Ooh. have come in since uh, since I didn't have any questions. Uh, the first one for the twenty marker. What would you advise if it is on other topics, not on the AEI? Uh, I, I mean, then it's almost anything. I, I cannot see any circumstances whatsoever where the twenty marker is not being listed on the AEI. I just, I just think that would be utterly unethical for the exam board to do that. Mm -hmm. So I think you should be deeply reassured that your twenty mark question will have been listed on the AEI. If I jump to the possibility that it hadn't, a, I'll be right into the exam board, um, and b, I would say it's then from anything. There's a couple of areas where you think that can't really be a 20 marker because there's not much there, but it could be It could be positioned with another topic and make a 20, a 20 marker. So that would be the point I make. I cannot see any circumstances whatsoever where your 20 marker is not listed on the AI. So I really don't, I wouldn't worry about that. I cannot believe for a second, but obviously I would do that. Okay, and do we need to know about in-event cooling aids? Um, let me check. Sorry, this is very much uh, off the cuff. Bear with me. You need to know about cooling aids. I would say the only thing that in event really refers to would be if you get injured. So that's where that injury type factor would come from. So there's no listing for in event cooling aids. There's never been a question on that. It's much more likely that what you would get is something like uh, if somebody twists their ankle, uh, how you know, then what might be that, that kind of like ice pack type thing. Now, there are exceptions. We do see in event cooling. I don't know how many of you stayed up late to watch the race walking in the Tokyo, Tokyo Olympics. The weather was 40 degrees and people were using ice towel wraps as they did the walk. That would be an example of when it would be relevant, but these are quite niche. I can't, I don't think you're going to get a question. I can't promise it to you, but I would say it's quite unlikely. Let me just think of other examples. So the towel wrap, someone might take on cold drink on the head. Um, outside of that, I, I think it's unlikely you're going to be getting something like that. I see a lot of uh, MMA fighters between rounds and they'll put an ice pack on the chest. But that is ultimately post-exercise or just between exercise. So that, those are the only examples that I can really think of. I'm not saying that's exhaustive. I haven't really thought about it in a lot of detail. But those would be three examples that I can come up with that in the worst case scenario you get that question then might provide you with some possibility of an answer. But I'll, I'll have a think, see if there's any more I can kind of consider. But those would be the ones that I would, you know, in that situation I would be answering. But I think it's much more likely it would be if it's if it's during a bit, it would be injury related. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Happy? Yeah. Any more? No, no more. All right. So I think we're making good time. We're at 4.34, according to my clock, so we're at good time. Uh, this little section will be about half an hour to 35 minutes that we're going to go into here. We're going to do strength training, flexibility training, and we're going to do rehabilitation, one specific part of rehabilitation. So lots of content you're going to need to scribble here, folks, especially on some of the, fa the, cross the factors of strength, flexibility, those sorts of things. So big focus, 35 minutes. Four or so. Let's let's nail this, and it'll be really worthwhile. And then we can settle into our evenings with a with a bit of confidence. We've done something good. Right. Let's get back into it. Okay. Let's talk training, and specifically strength training. Training. I've produced this image because I just want to show you that sort of notion of rate of contraction. Of course, our elastic explosive strength is more contractile, it's got a faster rate of contraction than static down the bottom end, but it sort of helps us to sort of define these things because we've got them on this position. So remember, your strength endurance, for example, this is about sustained or repeated muscular contractions. They could be sort of slower or quicker, but because they're sustained, they can't be at super fast contraction because you've got to keep doing them, right? We've got our maximum strength here. This, of course, is a maximum amount of force producing a single voluntary contraction. Now that is not as sort of slow moving as a static strength contraction, with static being force applied against a resistance with no movement occurring, hence the very low rate of contraction. Our dynamic strength, this is one that people often get confused about, a dynamic strength simply is referring to force applied with movement. We don't know how fast that movement is, but that's what we're talking about, dynamic strength. And of course, our elastic strength we are talking about here, force applied against resistance, uh, sorry, uh, with our elastic strength, we're talking about fast speed of elastic contraction or short series of contractions, okay? So these are the, the highest type of um, speed of contraction of all. Now, let's just move this on. I just want to talk about factors affecting strength first of all. So the, the first point I want to talk about here is fiber type. Now, you will have a decent understanding of this, I'm sure, but the composition of a muscle <coughs> with regard to fiber types and those motor units and what types of fiber the, the bigger motor units have, it affects how strong a muscle is. Now remember, our fast glycolytic fibers, otherwise known as our type 2Bs, they have the largest contractile force. Okay, now we know this because we've studied that particular topic, but depending on your muscle composition, that's going to that's gonna have an impact here. Now, I just want to remind you, motor units, again, we're not studying that here, but it may well be asked of you, motor units always, I'm going to put that in capital, always have uh, a single fiber type. So just remember that, that a motor unit, which of course is a collection of fibers, is always going to have a single fiber type that's universally within that motor unit. Now there's multiple motor units in an overall muscle, but of course the more motor units that are fast glycolytic, the stronger that individual is going to be. Now the other fact I want to talk about with facts affecting strength is effectively cross-sectional area. Cross-sectional area of the muscle. I just need to do some dodgy old drawing here. So if if I was to, for example, if I was to take, let me just do it in this kind of color. If I was to take, let's take this muscle here. Imagine this is a, uh, a, a cross-sectional cut of, let's say, the bicep brachii. This muscle here, we're going to argue, would have more contractile force than this muscle here. Why? Simply because its cross-sectional area is bigger. Okay, so the bigger the cross-sectional area, the more force that muscle is going to be um, capable of putting out. But also, we need to stress here that male muscle, male muscle, tends to be leaner. Okay, tends to be leaner. It sounds like we're talking about something at the at the butcher's counter, doesn't it? Well, kind of, kind of are in some ways. But what we're talking about here is that if this was a male muscle, we'd find it was kind of like it would be what you call lean muscle, lots of muscle tissue, quite not much marbling in it. Female muscle, because of the effect of estrogen, it has quite a lot of fat deposits in that muscle, which explains a couple of things. It explains why uh, a muscle would tend a uh, muscle would tend to have less contractile force uh, overall because less of its cross section is actually muscle tissue. Um, but the other thing 
it can uh, it can help us understand as well is and if you do things like uh, if you do things like bioelectrical impedance analysis which is where you actually measure uh, overall body fat composition you'll tend to find that females have a slightly, uh, slightly higher uh, fat composition than males for example now we don't really know why that is I mean people summarize it's probably something to do with um, carrying children and childbirth and, 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 and feeding children but we don't know why this is but just worth bearing that in mind but the effect of testosterone for men is lean muscle the effect of estrogen on women is that you tend to get this more sort of uh, fat deposit muscle which of course has got less force production and finally can I just say as well that if a muscle hypertrophies so if we get muscle hypertrophy what is effectively happening here is the muscle is getting wider and bigger in other words its cross-sectional area is increasing so what does that happen what happens there we effectively get stronger now i'm not going to do a lot around uh the, the test for strength can i urge you you need to be able to talk about these protocols so i've been really really clear on what those protocols actually are what i would like to do a little bit more of is just do a quick evaluation so if we're looking at grip strength uh, dynamometer test what are the positives of this well first of all it's simple First of all, it's cheap. That's a good thing. We like the fact that it's simple, that it's cheap. That's positive for this uh, particular test. We can also say it's a field test. So we like the fact it's a field test. You can do it in a classroom. You can do it in a gym. You can do it on the side of a football pitch. It's effective for that reason. But there are negatives to this test, which I'm going to sort of put in a sort of a, a rosy red color. Um, it's negative. It's not valid. It's not valid for whole body. Okay, so we can say it's good for measuring forearm strength, but we can't say it measures whole body strength. Another negative is it's maximal, which of course leads to motivational issues, and it's no good for dynamic strength because it's ultimately static. So it's not really good for measuring any kind of movement-based strength. So there's our little evaluation of that. Now our 1RM, we can do the same thing. You've got the protocols there. I want to put in your strengths and weaknesses. I want to put in strengths and weaknesses here. So strengths, first of all, it's very adaptable. Okay, so we can do one rep max test with almost any lift, well, literally with any lift. So we can do it for every area of the body. It's a direct measure. So we like that it measures muscular contractile force. It directly measures how much we can lift on our chest press for argument's sake. It only requires basic equipment. Now, of course, it doesn't have to. You could use posh equipment for this, but the base requirements are dumbbells, barbells. It's not particularly difficult. And it's a field test. It's practical. Its practicality value is quite high. But there are negatives to this test. It takes, so here's my first negative, it takes time. It takes flipping ages to do this with a whole group of students. You probably find this out. Even individually, it takes a long time to do all your one rep maxes for all your lifts. Um, you can't really do this with groups, as I said before, so it's not a particularly practical one. We've also got lifting is technique-based. Okay, so we've got the issue that if someone sort of arches their back or whatever it happens to be or doesn't lift with the correct technique they're not, we're not really measuring that muscle and the, finally that it's maximal of course it can lead to motivational stuff now when we talk about maximal by the way it's something called volitional states which is ultimately when someone gives up um, and, it, and generally speaking we find in most cases that people don't give up when they're at their maximal whether it's the monostate fitness test or whether it's the uh, uh, one repetition max they give up sort of through a psychological process now a press pin sit up test one minute press pin sit up test of course they measure your muscular endurance we just want to give a very basic evaluation here so a couple of positive things simple again we've got that word in here really good for groups that says groups believe it or not um, technique is easy okay so this is not a complicated actual process to undertake and we will and we like it because it's a field test you can do it in the sporting environment but there are negatives what are they going to be it is maximal, which again, come back to those volitional states and dropping out. Uh, it may measure pacing, not endurance or strength endurance. So if you think you've got to do as many press ups as you can in one minute, it probably depends how you pace that, right? And basically folks, it's not respected. <laughs> so it's not useless. But in reality, when it comes to really testing strength, you're not going to use that a great deal. Now, your vertical jump test, again, I'm not going to go through the actual protocol here with you. You guys will be familiar with and you can certainly read that table. But guess what? It's simple. It's cheap. This is not all practicality stuff, right? It's not, that was meant to be a positive, it's not time consuming. So it's quick, in other words which helps again a lot of these are about practicality aren't they and I can also say it's a field test so you can kind of do it anywhere basically but there are negatives 
it's leg power only okay so we're talking about it being whole body power well, eh, not so much uh, and also it's maximal okay it's maximal now this is where I want to spend a little bit more time on developing strength now again I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read through these these shots for you. you've got these here but what I want to do is just spend let me find myself a little bit of space to do this I just want to make sure that we've got some understanding of what this is going to look like okay so first of all if we are doing max strength and we're doing it through um, uh, plyometrics, we're doing it through resistance training. I just want to sort of set a bit of a standard. I'll allow you to read those images to get those notions, but I want to make sure our reps for max strength are going to be one to six repetitions. Our sets are going to be three to six. So we're doing three to six sets of one to six reps. We're going to find that our resistance is greater than 85% of one RM, one repetition max, okay? So we've got this high value. And our ratio, our work relief ratio, we're gonna do one to three plus. So let me just draw back slightly. We're gonna do in each set between one and six lifts. Now obviously if we were to do one lift, we'd go up to 100% one rep max. If we were to do six, that may be where we're at the 85 and the things in between, we might go to 90, 95, whatever. We're doing quite a few sets, up to six sets, over 85% one rep max, but folks, for every set that we do, for every one set, let's say that that takes 20 seconds, we're gonna rest for at least three times longer, let's say a minute. Let's now take this into strength endurance. So that was for max. Now for strength endurance, what would be our values here? So a couple of things I wanna put in here for you. Our reps for strength endurance are gonna be 12 to 21. 21's are really common, loads of reasons, but I'm not gonna go into them here. Our sets are gonna be two to three. Great to put these into a table, by the way, in your revision. Our resistance, we're gonna be between 60 to 80. Now, I don't know why they don't go to 85, but 60 to 80% of uh, one repetition max. And importantly, folks, our work relief ratio is less. For every unit of work, for every set, we get double the amount of time in rest. Now, it's important to realize that this amount of rest and this amount of rest could actually be the same amount of time because you might do 12, uh, 12 repetitions in one set, which means that this takes longer. Um, so, okay, you're only getting double the time, but still, it could be quite relevant in that sense. Now, just quickly, I'm not linking this to interval training yet, by the way. This one here is for elastic strength. Okay, so if we're looking for elastic, or let's call it elastic and dynamic strength, what type of... Um, details we want here. Well, first of all, we want 8 to 12 reps. Secondly, we are looking here at sets would be 3 to 4. Okay, Our, um, We'd be working at round about 80%, 1 RM, and we'd be working at 1 to 2 plus in terms of work relief ratio. But crucially, these would have to be done with fast contractions. So it leans towards that plyometrics nature, okay? Just on the plyometrics, folks, there's a couple of things that I want to cover on just plyometrics super quick up here. We've got the main details in here, but can I please, please, please urge you to include in your answer um, the concept of elastic recoil. Of course, you will already know that we are performing eccentric followed by concentric contraction. What does that do? It actually means that the muscle, when stretched through the eccentric phase, it increases its elastic potential, its recoil, and then contracts harder, okay? It, ultimate, it ultimately increases elasticity of the muscle. So this is really good for our power or elastic strength type considerations, okay? So I just want you to be aware of that. Everything else I'm happy with that's on there. Okay, let's take things a little bit further. I just want to, I'm going to leave you with the interval training to have a look yourself. I just want to mention one thing about weights, which I know is further up, but I just want to mention one thing about weights, which I think is really important that we get um, that we get down here. So we've got weights and over here, we've got the idea of a multi-gym. Okay, so I want you to be aware that weights are highly adaptable. I'm thinking about free weights here, dumbbells, barbells, this kind of thing, highly adaptable adaptable they really help to isolate muscle groups that's really useful um, they're stored easily now this might seem like boring old stuff but because we've got a, a rack for um, uh, for our, our dumbbells for example they're stored really easily and they can be done at home so free weights are a really versatile methodology our multi gym which of course is a bigger piece of equipment it guides 
movement so we might actually get more accurate technique this way although it's been achieved by a machine not necessarily by the person it's a large quick piece of equipment so it's large equipment so of course that leads to certain impracticalities it needs a specialist venue okay so most people are not going to do this without going to a gym for example um, it's expensive so we need to be able to differentiate between these two types and also it has less muscle isolation so less isolation it's really restricted movement the machine determines the movement okay so i just want you to be aware of those factors now this is a big section on strength i'm going to sort of finish it off here with the physiological adaptation adaptation sorry to strength training can i stress to you that you can be tested on neural metabolic and muscle and connective tissue let's just go through neural first of all there's only really two increased coordination of antagonistic pairs that's great from strength training fantastic we get increased speed of nerve transmission so we can activate muscles and motor units faster um, in terms of the metabolic we get more glycogen store think about your liver and your liver and muscle stores that's obviously for your particularly for your two a's and for your lack your glycolytic system higher levels of pc in the muscle increased atp stores increased duration of the phosphocreatine system and you get um, the output of the glycolytic system increasing when training for strength endurance so just to be clear this is increasing increasing output of the glycolytic it becomes more efficient now on our muscle and connective tissue we get an increased percentage of fast glycolytic fibers we looked at that factor affecting strength great across sectional area same point more force production now remember that force is transmitted via tendons which become stronger to attach to the, the skeleton the inter the increased speed of contraction especially with plyometrics so we become more powerful more elastic ligaments increase their stability factor around joints they need to do that of course and therefore we get an increased muscle strength throughout the full range and by the way by the way one of the things i very nearly put into factors affecting strength is not actually listed in your spec let's go all the way back up here i very nearly put in here um the idea of a weak point in the rom now just to be clear on what this would mean is when you're let's say you do your chest press for example you'll find that the very lowest position is actually hard to lift it's the weak point in the rom you'll find there's other points in the range of movement they're easier there's actually a factor that affects strength and then we must train for the whole range of movement for that reason now i think we're going to change canvases there back to you imminently okay let's do some questions on our strength training so we're asked here to identify the main type of strength so we must know our types from an olympic weightlifter and describe one weight training session they take part in so of course i'm looking here now at maximal strength so now my capacity to link that maximal strength into its specific requirements by the way i've included as well free weights probably going to be more likely for this person so i've gone for 90 percent one rep max in between 85 and 100 i've gone for five in between three and six i've gone for four reps in between one and um one and six and I've got three minute recovery at a ratio of one to three so can you see how the specific nature of that has been really linked to what we've just studied explain why oh by the way uh, one little er area that I meant to touch on with you and we've put it straight into the question here is that circuit training is an area that is referenced in the specification with OCR can I stress it's not been questioned before therefore with this question is actually quite, quite important I kind of wanted to teach it from here so let's just go to the question first explain why circuit training is often used by sports teams to develop strength endurance so it's mentioned endurance it's measured it's mentioned teams so stations can be timed for longer periods that links to endurance it's excellent with large groups uh, it requires relatively little equipment and can incorporate skills as well as fitness okay so you can see how those answers link to the sports teams and the strength endurance so um stations longer we've got practical for groups uh, we've got the idea it's very flexible can be structured for different roles i mean that's a really nice point there isn't it can be done in different types of spaces so it could be done for example on the hockey astro say it requires limited equipment it's practical and can incorporate skills so that is a really interesting answer of answers for circuit training so i urge you uh, to have a little look at that mark scheme and just sort of become familiar with it now we're going to move on to flexibility training immediately just give me the, the briefest moment just take the shortest of breaks 
So stick with me, folks. We're nearly there. We'll look at, let's look at types of flexibility. Well, the first one I want to talk to you about is static flexibility. Now, this is fairly obvious. It's ROM, no movement, okay? So it's holding a stretch, for example. Um, we're not moving. It's therefore static. I also want to differentiate between two different types of static. So we've first of all got static active. So we've got static active here. This is where we've got external force by the perform themselves. So the performer does the stretch, the performer themselves. Okay, so it's not done by a partner, for example. We tend to find this is done with body weight. You know, think about sort of lowering yourself to stretch your hamstring or something like that. But it can be done by a Dynaband or a Theraband, okay? So that's what we mean by active uh, static. But we've also, of course, got passive uh, static stretches. And when we talk about passive here, it's when we've got the external forces applied by a partner. So make sure you can differentiate between those. Now, of course, the other type of strength we have is dynamic strength. I didn't mean that. I meant flexibility. <laughs> so we've got dynamic flexibility. And of course, here we've got ROM with movement. And that's all we mean by that. Okay, so this would be examples of, you know, um, having a good dynamic flexibility at the shoulder when you're reaching over your head to hit a backhand clear shot in badminton or something like that. Now let's take it a touch further. We've now got our factors affecting. You guys need to be making lots of notes here, so make sure you are, please. So the first one I want to link to here is the type of joint. Different types of joints have different levels of ROM. Okay, so that goes without saying. So think about things like multi-axial joints. You know, especially like your ball and socket joints, for example, they have a greater range of movement. They'll be put in there, ball, ball and socket, right? You know, you've got your shoulder, which is much more flexible than, for example, your elbow. But also notice the differences between, let's say, two ball and socket joints. So if you were to look at the hip and you were to look at the shoulder, what would you notice here? Well, the hip has a deep socket and it is less, and stronger ligaments, and it's less flexible. Okay, less flexible. Whereas the shoulder, it's shallow, it's got a shallow socket, and it has weaker lig ligaments, and it's more flexible. But you'll also notice that people dislocate their shoulders, right? They fall on them, they pop out, and it hurts. So we've got this sort of trade-off of stability and flexibility. So think about that trade-off when you're describing different types of joints. Secondly, we've got age. Now, big picture here, and believe me, I found this out the hard way, if this flexibility declines with age. I'm a 45 year old man who should be more active. Um, I used to be a super active PE teacher all day long and I was super flexible. <sighs> Let's just say I'm not that anymore. My flexibility has declined significantly. But the other thing, it can be maintained with stretching. So it doesn't have to happen. It's not an inevitability maintained with stretching. Or you can do it like me, which is to mostly sit at a computer and work. That doesn't help a great deal and gives you a sore back. I'm feeling sorry for myself now. Let me move on. Okay, the other factor here is gender. Now, I find personally find this a really interesting thing to reflect on. Um, in fact, I'll tell you what I'm going to do here. I'm actually going to suggest that we set, call this sex. I think traditionally we've called this gender. I'm going to say we use the phrase sex as a better description of what we're talking about here. And that is to say that females generally will tend to have higher flexibility than males. And the reason this is, is believed to be the more prominent relationship that females have with the hormone estrogen and relaxin, which is another hormone. And it's believed that this increases flexibility in females. Now, the reason I personally find this quite interesting is I, I actually believe there's a whole bunch of um, I actually believe there's a whole bunch of social cultural factors in here, but let's not get into that now because time is pressing. Now, we've got two methods of evaluating flexibility, okay? We've got the sit and reach test, which we'll do first. So, strength of this test, first of all. Guess what? It's simple. It's cheap. It's a field test, okay? These are all super practical. The protocol is, is easy as well, but there are weaknesses, uh, to this test. So what have we got as weaknesses or negative to this test? Well, first of all, we can say here um, that it only measures, and we let's call it hamstring and lower, lower back. Okay, so that's a really important one, hamstring and lower back. And the other one is it does not mention, it does not measure dynamic flexibility, it's not dynamic. So that's a limitation of this particular test. Now, goniometers, can pretend, let me just write this in for you, goniometers can address this. Because first of all, the goniometer, where we measure specifically the joint angle 
of a range of a range of movement so we can measure all the way through that range of movement we, we're making a very very specific measurement here okay so this is a really good factor for a goniometer okay um, secondly is we're measuring potentially all joints or we could say it's joint specific all joints it's also accurate okay the only things that would get in the way of this for example is wearing the wrong clothing or inaccurate measurement and those things obviously can be taken can be taken into account so goniome goniometers are, are, are a really useful way of doing this how um, you've probably had a go at them i'd imagine however they're uh, time consuming as i said already there's a technique to this in the measurement and they're poorly understood so there'll be lots of errors when we measure this way, let's say in schools, because generally people don't know how to do this compared to how well they know something like a sit and reach test. But let's move this forward. We're now gonna look at a bunch of method of stretching folks. And I'm gonna actually gonna draw us back to this one and do this one in a bit more detail, but to make sure static passive stretching is a move, we move the joint into its stretch position using a partner or apparatus, or apparatus. So partner or other piece of equipment. A static active already covered this, performer moves the joint into its stretch position without an external force. And we said this is normally using gravity, but it could be like your Dyna band more of which in a second. Your isometric contract uh, stretching, isometrically contracting the muscle whilst holding a stretch position. Now, can I just clarify that both static, active and passive, they can both use an isometric contraction, right? That effectively, this is going to the point of the stretch reflex and holding that stretch. P and F we're gonna come back to, but static, contract, relax, repeat. I'll explain that in a bit, bit more detail. Ballistic is swing or bouncing motion that tend to be explosive. Now, just to be clear with this one, this tends to be for elite performers that will use this. Okay, elite performers will tend to use this because it can be contraindicating. And if you're not sure what that word means, it means it can do more harm than good. In other words, we need to be fit in order to do sort of ballistic stretching. And then finally, we've got our dynamic. Now, dynamic is control is a controlled form of ballistic stretching. It's just including movement. That's all that means, okay? Now, where I want to spend a little bit more time with you here is I want to spend a little bit more time on PNF. Let me find a little bit of a space for it. I, don't, I thought I'd included a little header for you. I'm going to put PNF stretching in here. Please get this into your notes, folks. It's really possible this will be a bunch of marks for you. I want to describe this process for you. Strengths, first of all, the positives. It inhibits, or, you know, effectively delays the stretch reflex. And the stretch reflex is the point at which a stretch will become firm and tight, right? It's the, it's the point at which a stretch can't be moved any further and it increases our ROM really efficiently. Okay, so it's a really good use of doing this. Now, how does it actually work? So let's go through our, our processes over here. First of all, what the way this actually plays out is our muscle spindles, which are the specialist fibers within muscles that feed back to the brain. Our muscle spindles, they relay to the CNS, okay? So typically when we stretch, our muscle spindles will detect that stretch, they'll relay that message, the muscle's being stretched, and then the antagonist will contract to actually prevent that stretch from going further, okay? So we're looking, at, in essence, to switch this off. We want to switch this off, or we want to delay this from occurring, because it's this that forces us, this stretch reflex, now this uh, must spend a reaction which leads to the stretch reflex. It's this that is ultimately preventing a, a, a stretch being moved into its great position. So how do we do it? Well, first of all, we do a passive stretch. In other words, a partner stretches us, folks. Okay, so we get a partner stretches us. Phase two, once they've stretched us, maybe they've, um, maybe they've sort of uh, flexed our hip for us, for example, we're gonna hold this stretch 10 to 12 seconds. The third part of this process is after that passive hold of 10 to 12 seconds, we're gonna perform an isometric contraction. And what we mean by that is that the, um, the participant is gonna push their leg back onto the assistant, okay? And that's gonna be held isometric, isometrically. We're then, going to, we're then going to repeat the passive stretch. So we're gonna do another passive stretch. But this passive stretch, it now moves through a greater ROM than this one, 
okay now how does that happen it happens because the stretch reflex which is the action of these muscle spindles is delayed it's delayed and therefore we can stretch through a greater range and the impact of that is five that we simply repeat that often two or three rep more like three or four repetitions and therefore we're able to stretch to a greater degree can i suggest this is not a warm-up activity Okay, this is quite intense and should not be done as a warm-up. You might do it in your cool-down because you're warm and flexible by that point, but you will not do this as a, as a cool-down. Now, as a, as a warm-up, sorry. Now, physiological adaptations to finish us off for the day, folks. First things first, we get, we get an increased, an increased resting length of muscle and connective tissue. Okay, I'm going to put muscle and connective. Now, by connective tissue, we're really talking about tendons there. You can talk about uh, ligaments as well, but tendons particularly important. Secondly, folks, second adaptation, long-term influence. We get an increased elasticity. So the actual contractile nature of the muscle and the rate it can do that, elasticity of muscle. So it actually becomes more elastic. So flexibility is not just about increasing your flexibility and stretch is not just about increasing your flexibility, but we actually get more elasticity in the muscle. And I also want to say connective tissue. So that means we can actually contract with more force. So you, how, I forgive the casual sexism of this statement, so you strapping muscular boys out there, by the way, forgive me, I know I'm, I know I'm generalizing, I'm almost doing it deliberately, but you know, just remember the stretching makes you more powerful. So if you neglect and undermine your stretching regime, you're really doing yourself a disservice. Sec uh, thirdly, we get our spindles, those are the specialist fibers within the muscles that detect movement. The spindles adapt to new elasticity. So in other words, the stretch reflex will then be delayed because of that. In fact, let me put that in. We now get a delayed stretch reflex. What does that mean overall? We are more flexible. Okay, beautiful. Let's finish off with some questions. Explain how a trainer uses PNF training with their athletes as a means of increasing flexibility. Well, it's fairly straightforward. It, it uh, inhibits stretch reflex. Muscle spindles are inhibited. You need an assistant, otherwise it's a passive stretch. You do an isometric contraction after the passive stretch. You then stretch through a greater ROM and you repeat. It's our protocol, it's what we just talked about. Evaluate PNF strengths and weaknesses. If we are evaluating, we are doing strengths and weaknesses, folks. Evaluate PNF as a, as a stretching. <laughs> sorry, evaluate PNF stretching as a method of improving flexibility. I mean, such a lovely question. It's effective uh, during. Uh, it can be done during a cool down, so it's positive. However, it's more technical, and it can take longer. So we got some advantages and disadvantages. So have a look at this, folks. Interpret that mask and make sure you're aware of it because. If asked to evaluate PNF, that's what we're coming up with now. Have I got any more? Oh, of course, rehabilitation from injury. Now, guys, can I please stress to you, folks? Can I please stress to you? I have not. Uh, this is specifically rehabilitation from injury. This is it. If I might show you when we're back on the camera, um, this is the specific section. Now, we are, need to engage with the treatments of these injuries: simple fractures, stress fractures, dislocation, sprain, cartilage. Uh, exercise induced muscle damage can i stress to you that this is the requirement which we've got here folks okay so first of all I, and again i can go through these for you if you want i mean it's absolutely I, I can go through all of these for you but more importantly folks i just want you to sort of i don't know how to say it can you just learn it and make sure that you can answer questions on that stuff it's th this is the information you in inverted air quotes need to know right i don't think you want me to read out to you so i'm not going to what i'm going to do instead just let me get me down to the right part of my uh, get me right down to part of my notes. Here we go. What I want to do instead is I just want to talk about the general treatments available. So when you when you look at that list above, they're going to come from the following things. They're going to come from the fact that you can undertake stretching as an available treatment. They're going to include things like massage. They're going to include things like hot and cold therapies. Again, if you look above, you can see these in the context of the specific injury of specific injuries. I'll look at one as an example in a second. We could be talking about AIDs, anti-inflammatory drug drugs. AIDs. Okay, let me write that out properly. Anti-inflammatory drugs. 
Okay, AID is module of which in a second. We could be here talking about physiotherapy. So let me just put physio. Come on, James, stop being lazy, write it out properly. Physiotherapy. And then finally, folks, we could be talking about surgery. Now, if you look above now at that table, let's just take one example. Let's go for dislocation. Call for medical attention, immobilize, do not relocate, apply ice if pain allows, and then anti-inflammatory drugs if appropriate. So you can see how what we've done there is we've taken this as our example of our treatment and we've gone in there. We're not going to start massaging a dislocation. If we look at, let's say, torn cartilage, reduce movement, painkillers, anti-inflammatories, prize strapping, medical advice, surgery to repair the tissue, it's often stitched, no blood supply, and that's why it needs to be stitched, monitor over time to identify um, signs of arthritis. Now, this is an interesting point. This would be called um, this would be called osteoarthritis. If you've got damaged cartilage through things like exercise, it can cause, obviously, pain, especially in later life but can i just sort of stress there that we've taken anti-inflammatories in the surgery and we've applied it in that case to the cartilage now evaluate the use of heat therapy as an evalu as an injury rehabilitation well it's good because it vasodilates blood vessels this decreased muscle stiffness and limits pain it's not advisable after an acute injury because it can increase swelling so that's why we might use uh, heat therapy and then last thing for the day, explain why non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs, so NSAIDs, are often used following an acute injury. And acute injuries are referring to things like, yeah, like a, a sprain, for example. So they prevent chemical release after an injury. So this is the why. They inhibit the inflammatory response. They interfere with pain signals and they reduce body temperature. So there's a really nice set of information there. And here, for what? for this and for this okay in this case heat therapies so really important that we're able to do that and hopefully that gets us there cheers and folks there we go um epic i think is the word for that what you might not have realized there don't you can hear in the background during all of that our cat which is just over there was snoring its head off i'm gonna get him hang on have we got any questions Martha? Yes, I've got I've got a few questions. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you want me to wait for you no. to bring the cat? No. Go ahead. no? Okay. Go so the first question is how much detail do we need to know about effects of heat on exercise and C V drift mm -hmm. in the advanced information? Right. In terms of the advanced information, nothing. Um, it isn't included on there. So let me just clarify that for you. Just bear with me one second while I get this set up for you so I can show you. So folks, I want to be clear here. What I'm going to answer is specific to the advanced exam information. Okay, That does not mean we don't need to learn it full stop. Of course, it could be on lower tariff questions. But if I now switch to here, I think you guys can see that okay, right? So what I would say here is that we definitely, and we obviously we covered this in the A&P section, exercise at altitude is covered on the AEI. But uh, this, the, the, it's taken from here. So here's exercise at altitude on the specification. Here's exercise in the heat, uh, thermoregulation and cardiovascular drift. That is not listed on the AEI. So it's in the specification. It is not on the AEI. So with regard to that specific question, which is um, do we need to learn it? In terms of the higher tariff AI questions, the answer to that would be no. Is a knowledge of that very, very useful? Well, first of all, think about cardiovascular drift. That whole concept was built around numerous of those ergogenic age. You know, we've got that built into our hydration. We've got that built into um, our blood doping even. So we, of course, we need to know it, but we don't anticipate there's going to be a high tariff question, though. No. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Another question, would there be any circumstances where we would be asked to state characteristics of aerobic training programs or mm -hmm. continuous and HIIT training programs? Well, there's certainly possibility of that. Again, it's almost the same answer to what I gave a moment ago. It's absolutely plausible that you could be asked that. But if I just go back to here again, we can say categorically that we were asked on the AI for strength and flexibility training. That does not mean that aerobic training, let me just find that on the actual specification. It does not mean that aerobic training won't be included. It just, it means that it's not gonna be a high tariff question. So this material here, so we've been asked uh, the, about that material there. Let me just put it in the middle of the page for you slightly. This material here, was not included on the AI. I'm not sure why that's not highlighting. It was not included on the AI. That doesn't mean it won't come up. It means that it wasn't worthy of us covering in this specific session because we only had an hour or so to get through as much content as we can. So therefore, for that reason, we focus centrally on the AI listed material. So it's the same answer really as the exercise. 
bless you. Exercise <laughs> in the heat and uh, thermal regulation and the cardiovascular drift, same, same answer. Okay, brilliant, thank you. And do you have any predictions for the 20 market topics? Oof. That's an easy one. Yeah, I, I don't like making predictions bluntly, folks, so it kind of worries me doing that because I just feel like the chances of like a clean hit are really, really slim and therefore the possibility of misleading people is really, really high. So I think it's irresponsible of me. So what I'd rather do if you're agreeable is I'd rather show you the history of the 20 market and then I'll sort of show you where that makes me feel, how that makes me feel and I'll point at a couple of topics for you. So let me just again share my screen. Uh, if I go into this analysis, now obviously what you're seeing here, folks, is a bunch of questions, right? Here's the 20 marker for 2018, 2019, 20, 20, 20, 21. This is how we analyze this work. So these are all the 20 markers they've ever asked. And I simply want to draw you over to here and tell you that, that those topics there are what's been questioned previously. So in 2018, it was, it was Epoch, Ergogenic Age Nutritional. It was Mechanics of Breathing, Responding to Injuries, Muscle Fiber Types in 2020 with Facts Affecting Strength, Newton's Laws, with responding to injuries. So with that in mind, and bearing in mind what we've got on our advanced exam information, the only, and it really is a guess that I could make, would be I wouldn't be surprised at all if it was stuff on energy continuum, which is what that section is there, and then it was on, let's say, certain types of ergogenic aids. That wouldn't surprise me at all, but could it be on something like linear or angular motion and strength training, absolutely. Could it be on angular motion, which could be to do with the diver going, you know, we're gonna talk about this in tomorrow's session, and that could be linked to flexibility training, absolutely. These could be absolutely possible. You already know that I've given you a 20 marker, which is on uh, movement analysis and plyometrics training. So absolutely plausible that that could combine with this. So my advice, I think my advice is learn Everything, of course, but learn that AEI material. That's why we're covering it in this way, inside out, and you will be red hot for a variety of those possible those possible combinations. It's not possible for someone like me to um, predict an exam. It wouldn't be advisable for me to do that, but those are some of the possibilities, and that's the history of the paper. So if you want to look at that history and think, okay, well, in the past, they've always combined two topics together, and you know, the only thing I was, I guess I was thinking, the only thing I was sort of wondering was if you look here, there's nothing in here which is like energy systems really, so that kind of gives me a leaning. And they've asked Ergogenic Age back in 2018, so four, uh, five papers ago, but they touched on nutritional. So I just wondered if it might be pharmacological, physiological, maybe. But folks, seriously, who the hell knows? And I would suggest that anyone who predicts questions, you should run a fair mile away from that person because they don't know what they're talking. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step back from what I was gonna say. The predicting, is in a, it's going to be inaccurate. Um, identifying some possibilities that hopefully gives you some ideas. Mm. What I would say is we've got tons of 20 markers on exam simulated teachers, get your students on there and get them practicing them. Be really valuable to do that. Great. Cool. Anything else, Martin? Any more no, questions? Not no more questions. Well, no. we finished almost bang on quarter past five as promised. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got half an hour. We've got a whole half an hour break, Martin, wow. before we do AQA skill acquisition for paper one on the AQA A level OCR. So think of us. We're now going to go bang straight into AQA A level almost to all you OCR lovely people. will say, have a wonderful evening. I can't think what's on the telly tonight or something. It's just kind of sunny outside. Go and live your lives, guys, and we really appreciate your um, your participation and your contribution. Teachers, get yourself get get photos, get stuff all over Twitter. Shout about this. Hit the subscribe. Hit the like. We appreciate it. Cheers.